Okay, let's go ahead and uh, take a look at this query language in operation. The first thing you might notice when I put up that little biblical database is that it's nice to be able to ask this language questions in relation to some uh, collection of facts. So let's, let's start off and, and make a little collection of facts. This is a tiny fragment of uh, I don't know, personnel records for a, a Boston high-tech company. And here's a piece of the personnel record of uh, Ben Bitdiddle. And Ben, ben Bitdiddle is the, is the computer wizard in this company. He's the uh, underpaid computer wizard in this company. His supervisor is Oliver Warbucks, and here's his address. So the format is we're giving this information, job, salary, supervisor, address, and there are some other conventions. Computer here means that Ben works in the computer division, and his position in the computer division is wizard. Uh, here's somebody else. Alyssa, Alyssa P. Hacker is a computer programmer, and she works for Ben, and she lives in Cambridge. And there's another programmer who works for Ben, who's, let me tweak it. And uh, there's a programmer trainee, who's Lewis Reisner, and he works for Alyssa. And the big wheel of the company doesn't work for anybody. Right, that's all over Warbucks. Anyway, what we're going to do is, is ask questions about that little world. And that'll, that'll be a sample world that we, we're going to do logic in. Let me just write up here for probably the last time what I said is the very most important thing you should get out of this course. And that is when somebody tells you about a language, you say, fine, what are the primitives? What are the means of combination? Right. How do you put the primitives together? And then how do you abstract them? How do you abstract the compound pieces so you can use them as pieces to make something more complicated? And we've said this a whole bunch of times already, but it's worth saying again. OK. Let's start. The primitives. Well, there's really only one primitive. And the primitive in this language is called a query. All right, a primitive query. Let's look at some primitive queries. All right, job X. Who is a computer programmer? Or find everybody find every fact in the database that matches job of X is computer programmer. And you see a little syntax here. Things without question marks are meant to be literal. Question mark X means that's a variable. And this thing will match, for example, the fact that Alyssa P. Hacker is a computer programmer, where X is Alyssa P. Hacker. Mm -hmm. Or more generally, I could have something with two variables in it. I could say the job of X is computer something. And that'll match uh, computer wizard. Right, so there's something here. Type will match wizard. Or type will match programmer. Or X might match various certain things. So there are, well, in our little example, only three facts in that database that match that query. Uh, let's see, just to show you some syntax, the same query This query doesn't match the job of the X, right? Doesn't match Lewis Reasoner. The reason for that is when I write something here, what I mean is that this is going to be a list of two symbols, of which the first is the word computer, and the second can be anything. And Lewis's job description here has three symbols, so it doesn't match. And just to show you a little bit of syntax, the more general thing I might want to type is a thing with a dot here. And this is just standard list notation for saying this is a list of which the first element is the word computers, and the rest is something that I'll call type. So this one would match Lewis's job as computer programmer trainee, and type here would be 
the cutter of this, li of this list. It would be the, the list programmer trainee. And that kind of dot processing is done automatically by the, by the list reader. Okay. Well, let's actually try this. The idea is I'm going to type in queries in this language and answers will come out. So let's, let's look at this. I can go up and say, uh, gee, who works in the computer division? Job of X is computer dot Y. Doesn't matter what I call the dummy variables. And it says the answers to that, and it's down four answers. Or I can go off and say, uh, tell me about everybody's supervisor. So I'll put in the query, the primitive query, the supervisor of X is Y. And they're, they're all the supervisor relationships I know. Or I could go type in uh, who lives in Cambridge. So I can say the address of X is Cambridge dot anything. And only one person lives in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Okay, so those are primitive queries, and you see what happens. The basic interaction with the system is you type in a query, and it types out all possible answers. Or another way to say that, it finds out all the possible values of those variables, x and y or t or whatever I call them, and it types out all ways of taking that query and instantiating it. Remember that from the, from the rule system lecture. Instantiates the query with all possible values for those variables, and then types out all of them. And there are a lot of ways you can arrange a logic language. Prolog, for instance, does something slightly different. Rather than typing back your query, Prolog would type out x equals this and y equals that, or x equals this and y equals that. And that's, that's a very surface level thing. And you can decide what you like. OK. All right, so the primitives in this language, only one. Right? Primitive query. OK, means of combination. Let's look at some compound queries in this language. Here's one. This one says, tell me all the people who work in the computer division, tell me all the people who work in the computer division together with their supervisors. And the way I write that as a query is and and the job of x is computer something or other. And job of x is computer dot y. And the supervisor of x is z. Right? Tell me all the people in the computer division, that's this, together with their supervisors. And notice in this query, I have three variables, x, y, x, y, and z. And this x is supposed to be the same as that x. Right, so x works in the computer division, and the supervisor of x is z. Okay, let's try another one. So one means of combination is and. Uh, who are all the people who make more than $30,000? Right? And the salary of some person, P, is some amount, A. And when I go and look at A, A is greater than... 30,000. And list value here is a little piece of interface that, that interfaces the query language to the underlying Lisp. And what Lisp, la Lisp value allows you to do is call any Lisp predicate inside, this, this inside a query. So here I'm using the Lisp predicate greater than, so I say Lisp value. And I say and. So all the people whose salary is greater than 30,000. Or, here's a more complicated one. Tell me all the people who work in the computer division who do not have a supervisor who works in the computer division. All right? And x works in the computer division. The job of x is computer.y. And it's not the case that both x has a supervisor z and the job of z is computer something or other. Right, so again, this x 
has got to be that x, and this z is going to be that z. Okay. And then you see another means of combination, not. Okay. All right. All right, well, let's look at that. Okay. And it works the same way. I can go up to the machine and say, uh, and the job of x is computer dot y and the supervisor of x is z and I type that in like a query right and it, what it types back what you see are the queries I typed in instantiated by all possible answers and then you see there are a lot of answers all right, so the means of combination in this language, and that's why it's called a logic language, are, are logical operations. Means of combinations are things like, like and, and not, and there's one I didn't show you, which is or, and then I showed you Lisp value, which is a, not logic, of course, but is a little special hack to interface that to Lisp, so you can get more power. Those are the means of combination. Okay, the means of abstraction. What we'd like to do, let's go back and for a second look at that last slide. We might like to take a very complicated thing, the idea that someone works in a division but does not have a supervisor in the division. And as before, name that. Well, if someone works in a division and does not have a supervisor who works in that division, that means that person's a big shot. So let's make a rule that somebody X is a big shot in some department if X works in the department, right? And it's not the case that X has a supervisor who works in the department. So this is our means of abstraction. This is a rule. And a rule has three parts. Right? The, the, the thing that says it's a rule and then there's the conclusion of the rule and then there's the body of the rule and you can read this as a piece of logic which says if you know that the body of the rule is true then you can conclude that the conclusion is true or in order to uh, deduce that X is a big shot in some department it's enough to verify that right, so that's what rules look like Let's go back and look at the, that merge example that I did before the break. Let's look how that would look in terms of rules. I'm going to take the logic I put up and just change it into a bunch of rules in this format. Right. We have a rule. Remember, there was this thing merge to form. There's a rule that says the empty list and y merge to form y. This is the rule conclusion. And notice this particular rule has no body. And in this language, a rule with no body is something that is always true. You can always assume that's true. And there was another piece of logic that said anything in the empty list merged to form the anything, and that's this. Right, a rule y and the empty list merged to form y. Those corresponded to the two end cases in our merge procedure, but now we're talking about logic, not about procedures. Then we had another rule which said uh, if you know how, how shorter things merge, you can put them together. So this says if you, wanted, if you have lists x and y and z, and if you want to deduce that a dot x, this means constant a onto x, or a list whose first thing is a and whose rest is x. So if you want to deduce that a dot x and b dot y merge to form b dot z, right, that would say you merge these two lists AX and BY, and you're going to get something that starts with B. So in order to deduce, you can deduce that if you know that it's the case both that A dot X and Y merge to form Z and A is larger than B. So when I merge them, B will come first in the list. And that car that's a little translation of the logic rule that I wrote in, in pseudo-English before. And then just for, for completeness, here's the 
Here's the other case. Right? A dot X and B dot Y merge to form A dot Z if X and B dot Y merge to form Z and B is larger than A. Right? So that's a little program that I've typed in, the, in this language. And now let's look at it run. So I, I typed in the merge rules before. And I could say, uh, I could use this like a procedure. I could say merge to form 1 and 3 and 2 and 7. And so here I'm using it like the list procedure. And now it's going to think about that for a while and apply these rules. So it found an answer. Now it's going to see if there are any other answers. Because it doesn't know a priori there's only one answer. So it's sitting here checking all possibilities. And it says, no more, done. So there I've used those rules like a procedure. Or remember, the whole point is that I can ask different kinds of questions. I could say, uh, merge to form. Let's see, how about 2 and A? Some list of two elements, which I know starts with 2. And the other thing I don't know. And X and some other list merge to form uh, 1, 2, 3, and 4. So now it's going to think about that. Right? It's got to find. Right, so it found one possibility. It said A could be 3, and X could be the list 1, 4. And now, again, it's got to check, because it doesn't a priori know that there aren't any other possibilities going on. Okay? Or, like I said, I could say something like merge to form, like what and what else merge to form 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now it's going to think about that. And there are a lot of answers that it might get. Okay. And what you see is here you're, you're really paying the price of slowness. Right? And kind of for three reasons. One is that this language is doubly interpreted. Whereas you know, in a real implementation, you would go compile this down to primitive operations. The other reason is that this algorithm, for, this particular algorithm for merge is, is doubly recursive. So it's going to take a very long time. And uh, eventually, this is going to go through and find, find what, two to the fifth possible answers. And you see they come out in some, some fairly arbitrary order, depending on, on which order it's going to be trying these rules. In fact, what we're going to do when they edit the videotape is speed all this up. So, you know, don't you like taking out these weights? And don't you wish you could do that in your demos? But, uh, anyway, anyway, it's still grinding there. Anyway, there are 32 possibilities. We won't wait for it to print out all of them. OK. OK, so the means of abstraction in this language are rules. Right, so we take some bunch of things that are put together with logic, and we name them. And you can think of that as naming a particular pattern of logic, or you can think of that as saying, if you want to deduce some conclusion, you can apply those rules of logic. OK, and those are the, the three elements of this language. Let's break now, and then we'll talk about how it's actually implemented. List value um, primitive or whatever interfere with your means to go both directions on a query. Okay, that's a. The question is, does using list value interfere with the ability to go both directions on the query? We haven't really talked about the implementation yet, but the answer is yes, it can. In general, as we'll see at the end, I, although I really won't go into details. It's fairly complicated, especially when you use not, when you use either not or list value, or or actually, 
If you use anything besides only and, it becomes very complicated to say whether, when these things will work. They, they won't work quite in all situations. I'll talk about that at the end of the, the second half today. But the answer to your question is yes. By dragging in a lot more power from Lisp value, you lose some of the, some of the principled power of logic programming. And that's a trade-off that you have to make. OK, let's take a break. Um.